This week we have a double Parsha, Parsha's Vayakel and Parsha's Pekudeh. Vayakel has 122 verses and one mitzvah. Pekudeh has 92 verses and zero mitzvahs for a total of 214 verses and one mitzvah. A few weeks ago we had Parsha's Teruma, and that gave us the instructions to construct the Mishkan and its vessels. The following week was the instruction to construct the various vestments, garments of the high priest. That was the instruction phase. In this week's parsha, there's going to be the implementation, the actualization of that instruction, where Moshe is actually going to do all the fundraising and do all the construction that was delineated a few weeks ago. And of course, one of the themes of the parsha that we'll talk about is the need for the Torah to repeat it in detail, almost uh, some sentences word for word from what the instruction uh, that was given a few weeks ago, whereas normally the Torah tries to mince words and try to say things in as succinct and pithy a way as possible. In this week's parsha, almost the whole parsha could have been shortly summarized in a sentence like Moshe actually did what he was told to do, and instead the Torah found the need to actually go through and delineate thing by thing, what Moshe did uh, together with his uh, lieutenants, Betzalel and Eliab and the rest of the Jews. So the parsha begins where Moshe assembles the entire assembly of the children of Israel and says to them, these are the things that Hashem commanded to do. So Rashi uh, right away rehashes his position that these these most recent parshios are not written chronologically. The Golden Calf episode that we read last week happened before the instructions of Parshas Truma Tetzava, before the instructions to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and its vessels, and the vestments of the high priests. But the Torah altered the chronology, as it often does, in order to separate the instructions and the implementations of those instructions for the tabernacle to separate that with the story uh, in in the middle of the golden calf. So when did this happen according to Rashi? This happened the day after Moses came down from heaven for the third time, like we saw last week. He comes down with a second set of tablets. That is Yom Kippur. The following day, there's the instruction and the implementation of the instruction to start fundraising, assembling the materials needed for the Mishkan for the tabernacle. The Ramban, he argues like he did right in the past, and he says, no, the Torah is actually organized, at least this part of it, in chronological order. The instructions were given before the golden calf, and now that they were forgiven for the golden calf, the Torah reiterates the implementation to kind of tell you that even though they were found defective via the sin of the golden calf, Still, they had repented and they had restored themselves to the situation where they were prior and therefore they were worthy now as prior to fulfill the mitzvah of the tabernacle. So according to the Ramban, there's a certain natural answer to our question of why the Torah found the need to repeat it. Well, because now we're being told that they didn't lose anything, so to speak, with this in the golden calf. There was no lasting impact, even though the instructions, the initial instructions were given before this in the golden calf. And then they sinned and they descended and they were almost destroyed. Still, the repentance brought them back to a state as they were prior and therefore they didn't lose anything along the way. Now, interesting, like we saw in the past, juxtaposed to the instruction to build a tabernacle is another warning against the desecration of Shabbos. On six days, work may be done, but on the seventh day, you shall be holy, a a day for God, a day of complete rest. Whoever does work on this day shall be put to death. And then we're told specifically, you shall not kindle fire in any of your dwellings on the Shabbos day. So again, like we saw in chapter 31 last week, even though there's a mitzvah to build the tabernacle, this mitzvah does not supersede Shabbos. You cannot do this work on Shabbos. And here our sages tell us, Rashi points this out again a second time, that this is another source that the prohibitions of Shabbos mirror what is needed to be done for the construction of the tabernacle. So our sages tell us in the Talmud that there's 39 different categories of work that need to be done for the construction of the tabernacle, and therefore there are those same 39 categories of work that are prohibited to be done on Shabbos. Interestingly, the Talmud tells us that this is also the source that prohibits punishment and execution on Shabbos. When there is a Jewish system of courts in place, part of their responsibilities is to mete out judgment, to mete out punishment, both corporal and capital. 
And on Shabbos, those things are suspended. The court does not dispense, does not mete out capital punishment or corporal punishment on Shabbos. Now, Rashi points out that, you know, we have 39 categories of work on Shabbos and only one of them is mentioned specifically, not to kindle a fire in all your dwellings on Shabbos. And the obvious question is, wait a minute, why are we not told any of the other 38 categories of work that are prohibited? Why specifically we're told not to kindle a fire on Shabbos? Why is that singled out? So Rashi quotes uh, the Talmud. The Talmud tells us that there are two reasons why this particular category of work was singled out. According to one is that the reason why it was singled out is to tell you that this has less stringency. The, 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 the category of work of kindling a fire on Shabbos has less stringency than the rest of the other 38 categories. Alternatively, the reason why kindling a fire was mentioned specifically was to tell you that you don't need to transgress all 39 categories of work at once or in one Shabbos in order to be liable any one of them alone, even if you did just one, even if you just kindle the fire on Shabbos, that would be enough to make you liable. Now, it's interesting. We know there were several sects amongst our people's history that decided that they want to obey only the written Torah, not the oral Torah. And the most recent one of these factions is the Karaites, who were really popular 7th, 8th, and ninth century. And then, of course, they petered out. And today, there's not really much left of the Karite movement. But their philosophy was that we obey only the written Torah and we disregard the oral Torah, the Talmud, the Mishnah, the tradition. That does not hold water in our eyes. And therefore, what does the verse say? You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Shabbos day. You should not have a fire in your house on Shabbos, meaning that there should be no fire or fire source in your home on Shabbos. So they would sit Shabbos in pitch black darkness because even if you light the candle before Shabbos, by their standards, it would be insufficient. And in fact, there is a tradition today to have hot food for Shabbos lunch, meaning it's already more than halfway into Shabbos and you still have hot food. Well, how do you have hot food Shabbos lunchtime? The only way you could do that is if you have a fire that you kindled before Shabbos and that fire, upon that fire, you placed the stew or whatever it may be. And therefore, the fire continues on Shabbos. As long as you don't kindle, as long as you don't initiate the fire before Shabbos, you're good to go. And we've accustomed to show that we're not like the Karaites. We believe that you can indeed have a fire on Shabbos, provided that you didn't kindle, you didn't ignite it on Shabbos, that would be okay. And that's why we go out of our way to have hot food on Shabbos lunch. Now, the Bet Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, who was, of course, the giant of the 16th century, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, he wrote... Uh, several books. One of them, the one that's maybe the least well-known, is the Magid Meisharim, which which is essentially a book, a diary of the conversations he had with with an angel who came to visit him every night. And the angel told him that this verse not only doesn't support the claim of the Karaites, but it actually proves to the contrary. How so? What, what, on verse two, we're talking about Shabbos. Six days you work and the seventh day, well, that's Shabbos. That's a holy day. That's a day of rest. That's a day for God. So what happens in verse three? You shall not kindle fire in any of your dwellings on the Shabbos day. Why does it need to add those last words? Biyom ha Shabbos on the Shabbos day. After all, aren't we just talking about Shabbos? Why is there a need to reiterate in verse three that you cannot kindle a fire on the Shabbos day? It must mean, says the Mag, it says the angel to Rabbi Yosef Karo, it must mean that only on Shabbos is there a prohibition to ignite the flame, to ignite the fire. However, if the fire was extant from before Shabbos, you would be allowed to keep it on on Shabbos, which is why we have lights on Shabbos, and we could you could even leave a, a stove on. So long as you don't ignite it on Shabbos, it is okay. Okay, so we have this preamble that... Moshe is gathering the Jewish people, and now he tells them before anything, don't do any work on Shabbos. And then he says, okay, 
time to fundraise. Moses said to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, saying, This is the word of Hashem that he's commanded us. Take for yourself a portion, fundraise. And of course, it's the same list of materials that we've spoken about the past couple of weeks. Gold, silver, copper, different kinds of wool, linen, gold here, various skins, the wood, the oil for illumination, the spices needed for the incense, and the various stones needed for the aphod, for the apron-like garment, and for the breastplate. Now, there's an amazing Ramban here in verse 5. He points out that throughout the entire portion, it talks about the heart. People who committed their heart, people who have righteous heart, people who have wisdom of the heart. And he says something very fascinating. He says the end result of the Mishnah, of the tabernacle, is that God's presence, God's Shechina, dwells there. Says the Ramban, this does not happen on its own. Rather, each individual who's contributing in some way to the project is investing their heart the seat of the Shekhinah within them, the, the kind of the spiritual spark that we each have within us, in our soul, in our heart, each one of them is contributing that towards the project and the collective sum of the hearts of all of Israel, that's the Shekhinah that indeed dwells in the tabernacle in the Mishkan. Very powerful idea. So Moses conveys the message. He makes the clarion call, the fundraising call for the tabernacle, and he also reaches out and tells people that we need manpower, people who are skilled to do all the work, and he delineates the various vessels needed for the tabernacle. So we spoke about them, the inner altar, the outer altar, the the kior, the, the basin, the ark, the shulchan, the menorah, all the various things that we've spoken about the last couple of weeks. So uh, Moshe has conveyed the message. Again, he wants people, manpower, personnel, talent. He wants also materials needed to do that. So every man whose heart inspired him came, and everyone whose spirit motivated him brought the portion of Hashem for the work of the tent of the meeting. Indeed, after Moshe's speech, the people, they rallied to the cause for the labor and for all the sacred garments. There's a very powerful Ramban here in verse 21. Again, he's talking about the fact that their heart inspired them and everyone whose spirit motivated them. So what does this mean? What is this power, this ability, these talents that are uncovered? So the Ramban, and this is similar to what we said last week about B'Tzalel, he said that people have their heart, so to speak, motivate them, inspire them, to the work. Again, like he said last time, these are people that until very recently were essentially slaves. They don't have a background in metallurgy, all this precise craftsmanship. These aren't journeymen, contractors, carpenters who have all this experience. So where did they learn? There wasn't a teacher. They didn't go to, to some school to learn how to do this. They had no one to guide them. Says the Ramban, each one of them found internally, they had this discovery of uncovering unknown talents that they didn't even know that they had. Because they had ambition, because they their heart inspired them, they had ambition, they had determination, and they discovered that they actually do already have it within them. They took initiative. They were opportunistic. They were bold. They put themselves out there and they discovered that, you know what? They could figure it out. Why? How did they figure it out? Because naturally they had the ability. They just didn't know that they had the ability. They took initiative. They were bold. And eventually they were able to figure it out and discover indeed that they could do it. They do have those latent talents. And this is another idea that, of course, we could speak about more broadly, that the people who are the ones who make it big, in whatever field, it could be, of course, in business, and it could also be spiritually. The people that actually make the impact are the ones that don't wait for someone to guide them, to mentor them, to coach them, to hold their hand and take them step by step. They're the ones who take action, who jump in, who dive in, who say, I'll figure it out along the way. And you know what? Along the way, they'll actually discover that the talents that they needed were already within them. They just didn't know it. And by taking initiative, by being inspired in their in their heart, they are able to uncover tremendous latent ability that they didn't even know that they had. 
So the people are ready and then they come with the donations. The men came with the women. Everyone came. Everyone's heart was motivated them. They brought bracelets and nose rings and other rings and bodily ornaments, all sorts of gold ornaments. Every man raised up an offering of gold to Hashem. People who had within their possessions various kinds of wool, the turquoise wool, the purple wool, the scarlet wool, the linen, the goat hair. Everyone brought what they had, the copper, the the wood. Everyone who had was able to bring what they had. Every wise-hearted woman in verse 25, we read, spun with her hands. They brought the spun yarn of turquoise, purple, and scarlet wool, and linen. And there's a very interesting Rashi here quoting from the Talmud. Rashi tells us that uh, the reason why they needed uh, wise-hearted women to do the spinning, you know, spinning, it seems like it's a commodity job. Everyone can do it. So what's the big deal? He quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says something very interesting that when they would spin this material, this fabric out of goat hairs, they would do it uh, when the hair was, was still attached to the goat and then made fabric and yarn with a live goat and spinning its hair. And that, of course, is a, is a talent that you need something, you know, some wise hearted people because it's a very special talent that is needed. And why would they do this? One of the commentaries tells us that there's a certain special luster that is present when something is connected to its roots. It's almost like the buy local movement. You know, if you take something, some produce from Mexico, you bring it to the United States or from New Zealand, it's it's not in the right environment. The, the thing that's closest to its source, that's when it actually has its its greatest potential to be perfect, to be beautiful. And therefore, the, the luster of this particular fabric was best when it was spun on top of the goat itself. So the people really responded to Moshe's call. And everything that was needed was indeed brought. And in verse 27, we read how the leaders, the Nesim, the heads of the tribe, they brought the Shoham stones and the stones for the settings of the ephod and the breastplate. Like we spoke about a few weeks ago, there were 14 very precious stones, 12 that were inlaid in the gold settings of the breastplate of the Choshen, and two on each one of the shoulders by the shoulder pads of the ephod of that apron-like garment that connected via a gold chain towards the uh, the chest of the high priest, towards the Choshen. So we have these 14 very precious and very expensive stones, and they are provided by the Nesim, by the heads of the tribe. There was an amazing and very maybe somewhat puzzling Rashi here about these Nesim, about these gifts that we received, that the Jewish people, that the Mishkan effort, the coffers of the Mishkan, the coffers of the tabernacle received from the Nesim, from the heads of the tribe. So Rashi tells us that in the book of Leviticus, there was another fundraiser. And in that fundraiser, it wasn't the Nesim coming at the end. They weren't coming at the end, the last ones to give a donation. Rather, they came at the beginning. Why did they come at the beginning here? After everyone donated, only then do we read about the Nesim, the leaders, giving the various stones needed for the uh, for the Choshen and for the Aphod. Why over here did they come at the end and there they went at the beginning? Because here they had a plan. They made a calculation. What they say? He says, well, they said, you know what? We'll let the community, we'll let the people donate whatever they give. And whatever's left over, whatever they don't give, we will cover. What happened? The people gave everything. They were so generous. They gave all the gold and all the silver and all the copper and all the various wools and fabrics. Everything was donated and there was nothing really left besides for these 14 stones. And therefore, the Nassim, they were worried, we have nothing to give. So the only thing that's left, they quickly jumped and they gave those 14 stones. And Rashi says this was a mistake. They made a mistake. They should have given ahead of time. And the Torah, how the Torah spells their name, it spells it in a way that indicates that they made a mistake. How so? Because in Hebrew, this may sound a little strange to someone who's not familiar with Hebrew, but in Hebrew, there's sometimes different ways to spell the same word. And the reason for that is, just like in ancient, just like in English, we have consonants and we have vowels. In Hebrew, the vowels sometimes are written in the form of letters, but sometimes they are not written in the form of letters. Rather, they are in the invisible nikudot. 
So if you learn Hebrew, you learn that on top and on the bottom of letters, there's various dots and dashes that represent the vowels that tell you how to pronounce a certain word. Now, the word Nisim, which means the leaders or the princes or the presidents of the tribes, it usually is spelled with all the vowels written in the form of letters. But here, when it's talking about the Nisim and their donation of the 14 stones needed for the aphod and the choshen, it deducts one of the letters from their name. Says Rashi, why does the Torah remove one of the letters from their name? Because they should have jumped ahead. They shouldn't have waited to the end. They shouldn't have tarried. They shouldn't have been lazy. And therefore, as a way for the Torah to criticize them, a letter is deducted from their name. Very interesting Rashi here, quoting from the sages in the Midrash. So with all the material assembled, Moses says to the children of Israel, See, behold, Hashem has proclaimed my name, Betzal, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, from the tribe of Judah. This Betzal is so talented, he's filled with godly spirit, with wisdom, with insight, with knowledge, with every craft. He is a true Renaissance man who is able to uh, be an expert in all the areas and all the craftsmanship. He weaves design to work with gold, silver, copper, stone cutting for setting, wood carvings, everything to perform every craft of design. He has the complete package. And he also has the ability to teach. This really, there's no better candidate to lead this effort. Him, together with Ahaliyav, the son of Ahisamach, from the tribe of Dan. He filled them with the wise heart to do every craft of the carver, weaver of designs, embroiderer, the, all the wool, the linen, the weaver, the artisans of every craft, and makers of design. So there's a few interesting things here that we see. First of all, one of the commentaries points out that not only did Bitzal have the ability to do all the work, but he was also able to mentor. And this is interesting. Sometimes the people who have all the talent, they just, they're so talented and to them it comes so naturally, they don't have the ability to convey that to someone who is uninitiated. Bitzal was that rare combination, like we said, a Renaissance man who had all the skills and all the knowledge and all the ability to, in all these various disparate fields, but also had the ability to teach that to others. He was also able to mentor enter to others. It's also interesting here, Betzalel, we get him, we also get his father, Betzalel ben Uri, the son of Uri, the son of Hur. Hur, of course, we saw him a few times already in the Torah. He is the son of Miriam, so he's the nephew of Moses. Thus, in effect, this is Moses' great, uh, great nephew or great, great, great nephew. That's uh, Betzalel. And uh, Betzalel's pedigree is given all the way back to Hur. So that we don't hear only about his father, we hear all, also about his grandfather. Whereas Ahaliyav, who is the other person who's leading the effort, we're only told Ahaliyav, the son of Ahisamach. We don't get his grandfather. So how come with Betzalel, his pedigree goes all the way back to the, his grandfather, whereas by Ahaliyav, it goes only to his father? So I saw two answers here. Number one, we know that Hur, he had recently died. Why? Because when the Jewish people were doing the synagogue and calf, he was one of the leaders appointed by Moshe to keep things in order. And he started to rebuke, to criticize the people. What are you doing? What's going to be? Well, you're making a golden calf? You're making an idol? Are you crazy? So he started to critique them. And they killed him. Thus, there is no greater representation of the flaws of the sin of the golden calf than Hur. And therefore, what happens? What do we have? We have the golden calf. What's coming to fix that? That's the tabernacle. It's so fitting that the grandson of Hur, he's the one who is going to provide the atonement, so to speak, for the murder of Hur, for the sin of the golden calf, which is represented by the murder of his grandfather. Alternatively, the Meshachachma, he quotes in the name of the Chassid Yaivitz. Chassid Yaivitz was one of the Spanish Jews who was banished during the expulsion of Jews from Spain in the end of the 15th century. And he says something very deep and powerful. We know the Jews of Spain were offered a very terrible set of options. Either you convert to Christianity and you could stay in Spain and maintain all your wealth and everything, or you leave with nothing. You leave penniless. And we know the Jews, half of them, around half of them, picked up and left. And about half of them stayed and converted. And most of those who stayed and converted, they said, you know what, we'll try to maintain our Judaism 
in hiding clandestinely. Those They became known as the Moranos or the Conversos. And of course, the Inquisition was dedicated to try to root out those fake Christians, those people who were secretly behaving as Jews. Which one of those groups made the right decision? So the Chassid Yaivas, again, he's someone who personally had to flee. He said, he says, well, the simple Jews, they said, well, wait, wait, these people are offering us to convert to Christianity or to stay as Jews. We're leaving. We're not asking questions. Don't overthink the matter. We're out. And the more sophisticated Jews says, well, we have a lot of money here. And well, we think that we're smart enough, we're clever enough to be able to do both. The, the people who were more sophisticated, so to speak, those are the people that had a more difficult time. And many of those people, they actually stayed. Similarly, what do we have? We have Hur. Hur is someone who is almost like he's simple in the story. The Jewish people say, we're going to go to the golden calf. And they have all kinds of reasons why it makes sense. Well, he's not, a, he's not an idol. It's a representation of Moses. They have all kinds of justifications for it. And the says, wait a minute. Simply, what are we doing? We're doing a golden calf? Don't give me any of your cockamamie, convoluted arguments. I'm not interested. This is a bad idea. I'm out. That sounds like a very simple-minded argument. And you know what? He was killed for it. They're like, no, no, no. It, they, they came with a more sophisticated argument. This is not idolatry. Of course, it eventually became idolatry. But they had all kinds of sophisticated reasons why they wanted it. The Torah tells us, B'tzalel ben Uri ben Chur. That Tzalel is the grandson of Chur. And you say Chur was unsophisticated? Look at his grandson. His grandson was, there was no one more clever, no one more capable, no one more gifted, no one more talented than Betzal. He was indeed filled with all kinds of wisdom. Now Rashi points out that we know Betzal came from the tribe of Judah, which was the tribe of the monarchy. But Ahaliyav, the son of Ahisamach, he comes from the tribe of Dan. And Dan, out of the 12 tribes, it's one of the four tribes that were from the uh, the other, the secondary wives of Jacob. And Rashi points out that there's a certain equality here between Mitzala and, and Ahaliyah, even though one of them comes from the most prestigious of the tribes and the other one comes from maybe the least prestigious of the tribes, but they are equal. The Torah is a meritocracy and therefore – even though one of them has a more prestigious pedigree, it doesn't matter. They're both equal. And this is, I think, a, an important idea uh, that we see again and again in, in, in Jewish history. And in fact, the Rambam points out in his introduction to Mishnah that in our history, we've had leaders who are the undisputed Torah giants of their era, who are either converts or descendants of converts, like Shmaya Naftali and Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Meir, Unkelis, etc. And he stresses this point because this reveals something about the essence of what we stand for. It's a meritocracy. You don't get in for free. You have to earn what you get. And no matter where you come from, you could reach the greatest heights. Okay, so we have a plan in action. The fundraising has been done. We've assigned... Betzalel and Ahaliyah together with all their helpers as the people who are going to do the job. And then we have chapter 36. That's the plan. Betzalel shall carry out with Ahaliyah and every wise-hearted man within whom God has endowed with wisdom and insight. And Moses summoned Betzalel and Ahaliyah and all the wise-hearted men and everyone who was inspired to do the work. And they take all the, all the gold and people start bringing Tons of gold and silver materials, and there's a problem. The, they, the, these wise people who are overseeing and organizing all the material needed, they tell Moshe, we have a problem. The people bring more, more than enough for the labor. So quickly, they make an announcement. Moses man that they proclaim throughout the camp, man and woman shall not bring any more for any more gifts towards the sanctuary. And the people were restrained for, for giving and that what they had brought, that was enough to do and even a little bit extra. So this is a fundraiser's dream. You have a certain amount of money you need to raise and you start raising it. And the, the, the first day people start showering you with so much gold and silver that you actually have to stop them. It's too much. You got to quickly, quickly. So they ran to Moses. They're overseeing the coffers. People are just coming and pouring, pouring in. Oh, we have to stop it quickly. And they make an announcement throughout the camp. So this, the commentaries point out, this shows their character. You know, this seems like a golden opportunity for a little bit of grift. You know, I'm working on the project. I can pocket a little bit. You know, there's, there's so much extra. 
And still, what do the people do when there's too much? They run to Moses. There's too much. And what does Moses do? He quickly stops everyone from giving. People are so excited to give, but they have to stop giving because there's there's enough, and we don't want to have any extra. We don't want to pocket anything from our from ourselves. Now, there's an amazing insight pointed out uh, by Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, who incidentally happens to be my namesake. He points out, he says, you know, at this point in history, the Jewish people are under the impression that they're about to go into the land of Israel. It's only sometime later, about a year later, where the sin of the spies happens in the book of Numbers that mandates that they stay in the wilderness for 40 years. So what's the plan in their eyes right now? In their eyes, the plan is to build a tabernacle, and quickly go into Israel, capture the land with Moses, build a permanent temple, and then put away the temporary temple, the Mishnah, the tabernacle, put it away to put that in, to archive that. In their eyes, this was only temporary. Yet, despite the fact that it was temporary, they still had a tremendous gusto, a tremendous drive to donate. Again, it shows us the generosity and the character of these people. Now, it is interesting that in verse 7, we read somewhat of a contradiction, that they stopped doing the fundraising, but the fundraising was enough for all the work, and there was extra. So was it enough, or was there extra? It seems like those two cannot be congruent. If there is enough, then there's it's enough, and if there's extra, then it means there's extra. So there's many answers given. One of the answers, the Archaim tells us that there was a miracle that the amount of gold and silver and other material that was needed was indeed more. There was extra, but it was enough because it was subsumed in the needed material. Like we said, there's miracles happening everywhere. And one of the miracles is that the gold, so to speak, absorbs some of the extra gold. And therefore, there was nothing, there was no extra. Even though there was initially extra, it was swallowed up by the other gold. And same was true by the rest of the other material. Okay, so we have everything that we need and the work begins. So they begin with the various curtains of the tabernacle, and these we already described in great detail in Pasha's Truma. You have the lowest curtain made of 10 curtains, and then you have one on top of that made of goat hair, made of 11 curtains, and then you had one or two more on top of that, pulled the covers of the tent of red-dyed ram hides and tachash hides, and then we have the planks at the side of the tabernacle made of wood. And again, these instructions were given in great detail. You have you have 20 on one side, 20 on the other side, and then six. And these are all one and a half amas, one and a half cubits wide. On the bottom, there's two silver sockets. On top, there's a ring connecting one to the next one. I don't want to go through it because we've spoken about it in, in, in great detail. So after the walls of the tabernacle are done and the covers are done, the partitions are made, the various screens are made. And then chapter 37, we read about the various vessels of the tabernacle, and it begins with the ark. So 37 begins, but Solomon made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. These are, again, the same dimensions we read about a few weeks ago. Now, the commentaries uh, point out that it does mention that Betzal made them, whereas, you know, we know Betzal made all of this. Why specifically does it mention Betzal here with respect to the ark? So Rashi says, and this is maybe somewhat uh, dovetailing nicely with what we just said a little bit earlier, the reason why it says that Betzalel made it, because Betzalel, he committed his soul for the work. Therefore, even though everyone else made it together with him, but who does a Torah label, who does the Torah give eternal credit to? It gives it to Betzalel because he, more than anyone else, was totally committed towards the project. And a nice lesson can emerge from that is the things that we truly own spiritually are the things that we really put our heart into. The Ramban, he says something interesting. He says, no, unlike Rashi, who says that, yes, everyone made it, but Betzal committed himself to it more than anyone else. The Ramban says that, no, actually, Betzal himself made it. And then says the Ramban something very important. He says, actually, if you were to compare the various vessels as to the degree of difficulty of construction, you would say that maybe the easiest one to do is the ark. It's essentially a box. How hard is that to make, right? It doesn't seem like it's very difficult. It seems quite to the contrary. It seems kind of easy. And yet, Betzalel is the one that does it. Says the Ramban, why did Betzalel himself do it? Not because it was difficult to construct physically, but because it was difficult to construct spiritually. What was really needed was not expertise, or not only expertise in craftsmanship, what was needed expertise in, so to speak, spiritual 
craftsmanship. And this is the idea like we saw in the past that when someone is constructing something for the tabernacle, there's a certain idea that they're trying to infuse within it that is the spiritual baseline of that particular vessel. And that's what Betzalel himself, because this ark is the most spiritually difficult one to make, therefore he's the one who made it. We read about the ark, uh, the cover of the ark with the magical, magnificent, swiveling cherubs, uh, the table with its gold crown around it, the menorah with all its intricacies, the incense altar, that's the inner altar, a term called the golden altar. It's somewhat confusing. There's the outer altar, which, which is really big, made out of wood and plated with copper. And then you have the inner altar, which is made out of wood, but plated in gold. It's much smaller, and that was used for incense every day, twice, and only uh, on Yom Kippur was anything else done to it. 38 begins with the making of the outer altar, which is called over here the elevation offering altar. Again, it's made out of wood. It's much bigger. There's horns, which are like these little bumps, uh, like on top of a castle, you would uh, imagine. It's it's square. And then, of course, it has a ramp leading up to it, not steps like we read a few weeks ago. It has all its paraphernalia, pots, shovels, basins, forts, fire pans, all that are made out of copper. There's a meshwork, which is a design uh, going alongside the body of the outer altar. And there are reams. In the reams, there are staves, there are poles. And then we read about the tiar, which is the water basin that you use to wash your hands and your feet. Now, what was the tiar made out of? So the Torah says, from the mirrors of the legions who massed at the entrance of the tent of meeting. It's made out of mirrors. And Rashi points out this is actual mirrors. And what's the backstory of this mirrors? So Rashi tells us something very fascinating, an interesting dialogue that happened over here. The daughters of Israel, they would look in these mirrors when they would put on their makeup. And when the call came to donate all these materials, they came with their gold and silver and everything, but also with these mirrors. And Moshe, of course, knew what this was used for. These are used by women to make themselves beautiful. And what is, what's the reason for that? Well, that's to inspire the Eid Zahara. So Moses says, no, 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 this is not can't be used in the tabernacle. This is something that Moses was disgusted by. This is not fitting for the Mishkan because this is what it's used for. And God resp- responds to him, no, 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 you take it. Because you know why? These mirrors are the most beloved to me. Why? Because through these mirrors, the women were able to spawn legions of the Jewish people. Because the men, after all, when they were slaves in Egypt, they were exhausted. They, they were almost on the brink of dying every day. You can't procreate under those conditions. But the women, they would make themselves beautiful. And they would entice and arouse their husbands using these mirrors. And therefore, these mirrors, says God to Moses, these mirrors are the ones that are most precious to me. And there is no better candidate for being used in the temple than these mirrors. Now, it's interesting. The commentaries question, you know, Moses is willing to accept all kinds of personal items from women, uh, various rings and rings that went in the nose and bracelets. And even uh, in verse 22 of chapter 35, even various ornaments that were worn by women in their, like near their private area, near their genitalia. And here Moshe is not taking the mirrors. It seems, uh, it seems a little bit inconsistent. So the Ramban answers, he says, well, the various gold ornaments those things were all melted together, and therefore it became one big pot. So it doesn't matter what the origin of the gold was, whereas the mirrors are going to be used as is, and therefore Moses felt that it's not appropriate. Mirrors that were used for women to beautify themselves, that's not appropriate to be used in the tabernacle. And I think it's something that's it's worthwhile to ponder a little bit over here. You know, we see polar opposite responses to these mirrors. On one hand, Moses, he's disgusted by it. He says, this is, this is not a good candidate. This is used for the Yitzhahara. And God responds with the absolute extreme argument. Not only is he not disgusted by it, he says, there's nothing better than this. This is the best. And I think it's, it's kind of puzzling. How is it possible that Moses and God have such diametrically opposed 
positions on this matter. How's the apostle on Moses is like, this is disgusting. This is terrible. This is used for the Yitzhahara. This is used for the evil inclination. This is not something that should be used in, in, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. And God says, no, no, no. This is the best thing. This is the most desirable thing in my eyes. What's, in fact, the disagreement? So I want to suggest maybe an answer based on the Talmud in the book of Sot on page 17a. The Talmud says uh, that a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, if they are meritorious, if zahu shechina b'nei, then the shechina is amongst them. If they're meritorious, the shechina is amongst them. However, if they are not meritorious, a fire will consume them. Says Rashi, what does this mean? The word ish means man, and the word isha means woman. And both of them have the same letters, aleph shin, which is ish, which means fire. But the man has aleph yud shin, and the word woman has aleph shin, hey. And the letters yud and hey, they're the name of God. Therefore, when a man and a woman are in their idealized situation, God is amongst them. You have the name of God. Whereas if you re- withdraw the name of God, you take the yud away from the man and the hay away from the woman, you have ash and ash, you just have fire. Their names, when God is removed from them, is just it just means fire. So what does this mean? So our sages explain to us that what this means is that a man and a woman in their most intimate relationship If they are meritorious, then God is amongst them. That union can be the most spiritual acme, pinnacle of human experience. God's amongst them. The Shekhinah is amongst them. That's if they're meritorious. Whereas if they're not meritorious, that same union, all you have is fire. Which means a very powerful idea. The Yetzirah, the evil inclination that's there to spur us towards Sin, really, that really depends on the context. If they're meritorious, then that union, that thing that could have been a sin, well, actually, it was a representation of the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is amongst them. That very same union, if it's devoid, if it's been denuded of God's presence, all you have is the fire of the evil inclination of the Yitzhara. Both God and Moses, so to speak, when they saw these mirrors, they saw the Yetzirah. They saw the evil inclination. They saw the passion, the arousal, the lust, the licentiousness of marital intimacy. Moses is like, well, this is not has no place in the in in the tabernacle. This is the Yetzirah. What is this doing over here? It doesn't belong. And God says, quite the contrary. There is nothing more desirable for me. Because in the way that they did it, in the efforts that they took to bring the Jewish people to where they are today, a mighty nation, a nation worthy of accepting the Torah, that was actually a variety of marital union that is meritorious. And therefore, God is amongst them, the Shekhinah is amongst them. And indeed, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, you're trying to bring God, you're trying to bring the presence of God, the Shekhinah, there is no better candidate to do that than those mirrors that symbolized a union of husband and wife when they are indeed meritorious and God and God's Shekhinah is amongst them. The Parsha concludes with the construction of the courtyard, which is the surrounding area of the courtyard in which the Mishkan was held. And then there's the screen at the entrance of the Mishkan and thus concludes Parsha's Vayakil. Parsha's Pekude begins with a counting of the materials used or some of the materials used for the tabernacle. And the word pekude means counting or translated sometimes as reckoning. These are the reckonings of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, which were reckoned by Moshe, the labor of the Levites under the authority of Isamar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen. And right away, Rashi tells us one of the major themes of the Mishkan the reason why the tabernacle is called the tabernacle of testimony because it serves as testimony to the fact that the Almighty forgave the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf. A few weeks ago, we read Jewish people wanted to do an idol, and that, of course, was a terrible sin. And nonetheless, despite the fact that Jewish people seem to have repudiated God, still he agreed in the tabernacle to dwell amongst us, to have his presence, his shechina, dwell amongst us, and therefore... This Mishkan serves as a testimony to that. And one of the other commentaries points out 
that if you look at the format of this verse, it begins, these are the reckonings, Ele Pekudeh Mishkan. And he points out that in the episode of the golden calf in chapter 32, verse 4 of Exodus, it says, Ela, the same word, these are your gods, O Israel, who took you out of the land of Egypt. And the commentaries suggest that there's a certain connection between the sin, so to speak, the sin of the golden calf that expelled God, so to speak, or repelled God away from us, and the expiation of that, the fixing of that, that we have over here with the Mishkan, that it too has the word Ela, these, because it is the fixing, it is the amending of the sin of the golden calf. Now the Parsha is going to begin, like we mentioned earlier, with counting the gold, how much gold was there, what was the total weight of gold, what was the total weight of the assembled silver and copper. And there's a very lengthy midrash here about the reason why we have to begin again to talk about the supplies that were donated and also to list them, to make like this list of how much, how many pounds, so to speak, how much weight do we get of gold, silver, and of copper. And the midrash tells us that there were scoffers amongst the Jewish people and they were snickering behind Moses' back and they're saying, ooh, Moses is raising all this money, all this gold, all this silver to build the tabernacle and it's stored in this big storage house. I bet Moses is taking a cut of the money. And therefore, but when Moses found out about that, he said, oh, okay, you suspecting me of taking a cut of illegally embezzling some of the money that was designated for the tabernacle. When we're done here, I promise that we're going to make an accounting, we're going to make a reckoning, we're going to see exactly how much came in, and I'll prove beyond any doubt that I didn't take anything. I was completely honest. I acted with complete integrity in overseeing the materials for the Mishkan. And the Midrash goes on to say, quoting the Talmud, that with regards to appointing someone to oversee matters of the public, if that job is a job that involves public funds. If you have someone who's in charge, let's say, of the shul treasury or the school treasury, whatever it is, if there's public funds that need to be overseen, it should not be one person one person alone that has the keys to the coffers. There should be a minimum of two, and that way they'll have to collaborate in order to steal. Same thing over here. Moses, even though if anyone is unimpeachable, if anyone is a beyond reproach, of course, it's it's Moses. But nevertheless, he insisted to always have Isamar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen, always have him with him, never to be suspected of any sort of graft or embezzlement or stealing from the public funds. And the Torah goes on to say, how much gold do we have, how much silver do we have, and how much copper and the number is a pretty astronomical. There is 29 talents of gold. A talent of gold is about 100 pounds of gold, an incredible amount of gold, and uh, even more silver. And one of the commentaries, the Sephora, tells us something very interesting. He says if you compare the amount of gold and precious materials used in the Mishkan, yes, it's a lot, but compared to what was used in the first and second temple, when the Mishkan is, of course, a portable temple, and you could disassemble it, move it, and when you get to your new location, put it together again. But once you have a permanent temple, it's a much larger edifice, and there's much more gold, both in the first temple built by Solomon, the second temple and that was, of course, refurbished by Herod to be made the most beautiful building in the world with incredible amounts of gold that dwarfed what we have over here. Says the Sephorno, there's an incredible lesson here. The reason why God dwells amongst the Jewish people and in the Mishkan has nothing to do with the amount of gold, rather it has to do with their character. Because these people fear God, their actions made them worthy of God dwelling amongst them. Therefore, the peak of divine presence amongst the Jewish people was in the Mishkan, it was, still pre- it was still present in the first temple, but once the second temple came around, it was much more diminished. Uh, and despite the fact that all the gold, the gold is not what brings God. It is the character of the nation that has built and that is living with the temple or the tabernacle. 
Now, we're told that there's a hundred talents of silver, and there's also a hundred silver sockets, and each one of those silver sockets is one talent of silver. Now, it's interesting that the majority of the items that were fundraised for the Mishkan were done based upon the largesse and magnanimity of the donors. There was only one thing that was obligatory for everyone, and that is the half shekel that everyone gave, and that was used to make these silver sockets that go underneath at the base of the walls of the Mishnah, the walls of the tabernacle, and that were used to hold up the wooden beams. And I think maybe there's a, there's a deep lesson here that, you know, the Jewish people, they can have a relationship with God that is embodied by the tabernacle. And the great relationship, of course, is there's all these things that, that the two partners in the relationship do for each other, that they do have the goodness of their heart. They're inspired, they're generous, they want to act good towards their partner. However, every great relationship, it's not enough to have the things that you do have the goodness of your heart. There has to be a basis of obligation. The foundation has to be obligation. Similarly, a few weeks ago, we had, of course, the episode of the giving of the Torah at Sinai, and we read, quite interestingly, that the Jewish people, they committed themselves. They were in. They said, nah, seven ishma, we will do, we will listen, whatever God tells us, we're on board. Yet, the Talmud tells us that despite the fact the Jewish people voluntarily agreed to be all in, God took the mountain and wielded it on top of them and said, you better accept the Torah or else I crush you to death over here. I don't get it. If the Jewish people already pledged that they are in, why did God need to wield the mountain over them? Why did he need to force them to accept it based upon this obligation? And the answer is that despite the fact that Jewish people, they agreed to adopt the Torah, the foundation of everything is the obligation. I think, you know, similarly with, with marriage, any, any sort of relationship, but certainly marriage, the couple loves each other and that's amazing. And if they don't have that, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. But there's still a certain concretization. There's still a certain commitment that the marriage begins with. It's not enough to have the love. You also have to have the commitment. And that's the way to ensure a harmonious and lasting relationship. And one of the commentaries tells us something very fascinating. The Balhaturim here says that the hundred silver sockets that held up the beams, they correspond, the Talmud, the Talmud tells us that every day we're supposed to make a hundred blessings. Of course, when we pray, there's all kinds of blessings that we say when we pray, when you eat, when you go to the bathroom, but the sum total every day should be a minimum of 100 blessings. Now, if you just say the three daily prayers, you have about 90 or so. So all you need is to eat a few things, and if you make before blessings and after blessings, go to the bathroom a couple of times, you should have it covered every day. But the Talmud says that you have to have 100 blessings a day. And it's an interesting correlation here, it's an interesting comparison that these silver sockets that lie at the basis of the Mishnah, of the tabernacle, they correspond to the hundred blessings that we say every day. Every time we say, Baruch HaTah Hashem, Blessed Yer Hashem, we're again reinforcing this relationship that we have with God, reminding ourselves of the obligation to thank Him before we partake in the pleasures of this world. And that creates the basis of our internal mission, our internal tabernacle, our internal relationship that we have with God that is manifested with our daily blessings. Okay, so we have counted the amount of gold and silver. The Torah tells us again how much copper. There were 70 talents of copper. And then we're going to talk about the creation of the vestments of the garments of Aaron, the high priest. Chapter 39 begins from the turquoise, purple, and scarlet wool. They made knit vestments to serve in the sanctuary and they made the holy vestments for Aaron as Hashem commanded Moses. Now, it's interesting. This is the first of more than a dozen times that this formulation appears in the parsha. As Hashem commanded Moses. Everything that Moses did and he directed Betzalel and Ahali of the people that were in charge of this whole operation, everything was done precisely, exactly 
as God commanded Moses. Now, the fact that it's repeated again and again should, of course, raise some eyebrows. Wouldn't it be sufficient to just say it once at the end? Wouldn't that tell us that same message? Why is there a need to repeatedly tell us that everything that was done was done as God commanded Moses? So maybe there's several answers here. Uh, one of the answers is that Moses is creating or is overseeing the garments that are going to be given to Aaron. And as we mentioned a few weeks ago, Aaron himself was really not supposed to be the high priest. It was supposed to be Moses. So Moses has to come and craft or oversee the crafting of the garments that are given to his brother who is supplanting him, who maybe in his eyes could have been usurping him as the high priest. Nevertheless, he didn't deviate at all from his commandment of his instruction. Everything he did, he did exactly the way God commanded him. He wasn't at all adding any enmity or any biases vis-a-vis these garments. He just did everything exactly the way God commanded him. Alternatively, there's another deep lesson here uh, that we find by some of the commentaries. And they suggest, like we said earlier, that really the tabernacle is a reflection of the atonement for the golden calf. The golden calf, there was a lot of reasons why the Jewish people decided that this was the proper thing to do. And of course, in our eyes, they made a serious blunder, and they did. But they had their justifications. They said, well, we we need someone to replace Moses, and this made sense. And they had all kinds of justifications, but ultimately, they did it on their own. And they forgot that really what they should have done is say, what does God want us to do? And therefore, how do you fix the problem of the golden calf, the problem of the people acting independently, irrespective of the will of God? You again and again and again repeat, this I'm doing because God commanded us, God instructed us exactly the way God instructed Moses. By closing out your own mind, by stopping to invest your own perspective on the matter, what you think about it doesn't matter. It's only what God says. That is the way to fix the sin of taking your own good intentions and creating something akin to idolatry. So we begin with the aphod. The aphod is that apron-like garment. It's made of gold, turquoise, purple, scarlet wool, and twisted linen. And we've already described what it looks like. It has the, the two shoulder straps that go on top. On the two shoulder straps, you have those shoham stones, which connect to the choshen, the breastplate uh, that goes on the chest of, of Aaron. Again, it lists the 12 stones of the choshen upon which the names of the children of Israel, the tribes of the Jewish people, were etched. Now, it is interesting that these 12 stones, the Torah gives us the names of these 12 stones, but collectively they're called the Avne Miluim. So there's a, there's really 14 stones, two of them that go on the shoulder pads of the aphod, and 12 of them go on the choshen, go on the breastplate. And they are called collectively the Avne Shoham, the Shoham stones that go on the shoulders, and the Avne Miluim. Now what does that mean? This group of 12 precious stones, each engraved with the name of one of the tribes, they're inlaid in 12 gold settings in the breastplate. And each one of them are quite expensive and very valuable. Yet the Torah collectively calls them the Avne Milum, which means literally the filler stones, referring to the fact that they fill the gold settings in the Choshen in the breastplate. It's kind of odd. Why would the Torah refer to these incredibly valuable, precious, very expensive stones simply by the fact that they fill the void in the Choshen in the gold settings in the breastplate? Maybe the answer is that the most important job that anyone could do is to do the job that needs to get done. And therefore, yes, these stones on their own are very valuable, but even more valuable, even more precious than what the stones themselves is the fact that they have a role. And the role is there's a void of the Hoshen and they have to fill that job. And sometimes I think the lesson for us is that sometimes the jobs that we need to do are not so glamorous and they're not so exciting, but... Even when they are glamorous, we have to realize that what we really need to do is is we're put into this world, we're giving our mission, and our mission is to do whatever it is that needs to get done, and that's our job, that's our responsibility. 
Now, the Talmud tells us something very fascinating, that the names of the 12 tribes were etched onto these 12 stones. How exactly were they etched? You would think maybe with a chisel, maybe with maybe they were written down in paint or with ink. Says the Talmud, no. There's a special animal. It's very small. It's the size of a barley. It's called a shamir. And this animal, in fact, the Talmud tells us, is one of the 10 things that were created during the first week of creation between Friday and Shabbos, at that twilight period where Friday is almost over and Shabbos is almost beginning. It's kind of that overlapping time between Friday and Shabbos. That's the time that there were 10 things that were created. And the commonality that that these 10 items share is the fact that they are hybrids. Shabbos, of course, is a day that's all spiritual. And then the six days that are physical, that are material. The themes that were created between Friday and Shabbos during that twilight zone, those are the things that are, that are the hybrids. This shamir, this special animal, it's a worm of sorts, that was created during that twilight zone. And the way that engravings were done is that they would write the letters of the names of the tribes, and then they would have this animal trace those letters, and as it traced it, it had some sort of power that it would etch into the stones those names. A pretty interesting thing. The Talmud goes on to say, well, how do you actually transport it? Everything you put it in, it would continually etch it. The Talmud even says that if you put it on top of a mountain, this small little animal, put it on top of a mountain, if it goes over the mountain, whatever whatever covers, it's totally splitting. So if it's on a mountain, it's splitting the whole mountain. And again, this is something that it's very hard for modern ears to absorb, uh, that there's such an animal that has such powers. But think of it as some sort of nuclear bomb. It's it's really not a lot of material, but it has incredible force. I don't know. It's a laser. It's some sort of power that is condensed in this very special animal, and it was able to split uh, the stone and etch in it the names of the Jewish people. And the Talmud goes on to tell us that when King Solomon constructed the first temple, he had to cut stone. And the problem is you cannot cut stone, again, to make the walls of the temple. You can't cut stone with metal. That's a prohibition. You can't use metal to cut any of the stones used in the, in the temple. So what did he do? He found this shamir, and this shamir, the special animal, cut the stones for him. Pretty cool. After we read about the ephod, we read about the rest of the garments of the high priest. We read about the me'il, which is the robe, and the various tunics, and the head plates, and the crown. And finally, everything has been concluded. Verse 32, we read, All the work of the tabernacle, the of meaning, was completed, and the children of Israel done everything that Hashem commanded Moses, so did they do. They're finished with the work, and they bring it to Moses. They brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, and all its utensils, its hooks, its planks, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the cover, the ark, various other vessels, everything they bring it to Moses, everything they did precisely the way God commanded Moses. Moses saw the entire work, and behold, they had done it as Hashem commanded, so had they done, and Moses blessed them. So I want to kind of circle back to the central question that the commentaries discuss on this Parsha. Again, if you look as at a retrospective of the book of Exodus, you have the five final Parshios almost exclusively dedicated to building the tabernacle. And we have what seems like tremendous repetition with the instruction and then the assembly and then at every stage of the way kind of taking an accounting I want to suggest another way to maybe understand this whole idea. Again, we have the instructions to build the tabernacle, all its vessels, and all the garments of the high priest. In the middle, you have the story of the golden calf, and then you have the instruction being implemented afterwards. I want to suggest that maybe there's another deep lesson here, and that is to build something great, you first need to flounder. Earlier failure is almost inevitable if the accomplishment is really great. And there's a, there's a Midrash that says, quoting a verse 
in scripture that if I didn't have darkness, if I didn't have the earlier struggle, I wouldn't have the light that I have today. And the Talmud, in fact, tells us that for us to do a mitzvah perfectly, which is really the goal of why we're here, we first have to do a mitzvah imperfectly. And even though doing a mitzvah imperfectly is problematic, after all, how could you do a mitzvah that's not perfect? But really, that's the only path forward. The, the blunder is really the first step of growth. The lower runs of the ladder are low for a reason because they're really rife with mistakes and you really can't skip it. There's no way to leapfrog the problems, the errors, the blunders in whatever project it is and just have success out of the gate. And the Talmud of the book of Gittin, page 43a, tells us, even with regards to Torah, a person cannot understand the words of Torah well unless they first have failure. Failure is not incidental to the future growth. The scripture tells us that the tzaddik, the righteous one, falls seven times and keeps on getting up. So we think maybe, well, despite the fact that the tzaddik, the righteous one, faltered seven times, he still gets up. But really the answer is no. That because the tzaddik faltered seven times, that's the reason why he became the great person that he became. And this is something that we see throughout history. The major efforts to do anything great, they kind of trip up at the beginning until eventually they arrive at the ultimate accomplishment that they need, that they eventually become. So if you think about the Mishkan, you know, you have this planning, this coordination, this effort into a major project to have the Almighty dwell amongst us. And you're sure that everything's going to go swimmingly. Everything's going to be under budget and ahead of schedule. And what do we read about? We read about the worst sin of Jewish history. Do you want to bring the Almighty into the world? Or do you want to bring an idol? And what happens right after the Jewish people atone for their sin? You get back to work. And maybe the lesson for us is, is that every project that we undertake will have its phase where there's going to be despair. Will we accomplish what we want to accomplish? Will there be success or not? Every project's going to have its golden calf. And maybe it's kind of reassuring to read that even after the huge mistake, the huge blunder, it's still possible to build that magnificent edifice. And the Torah details every step of of the building process, and it seems to be exactly like how it was conceived earlier to tell us that really there was nothing lost along the way. The, the the misstep of the golden calf did not have any lasting effects. I once heard from one of my teachers something very scary. And he said that every couple that gets married, they're sure, at least at some point in the early stages of their marriage, they're, they're sure that they married the wrong one. They're sure. They made a mistake. Can't be. Can't be that this is the right one. Which to me, that was an astonishing statement. But I think in this light, you know, two people want to get married and they want to build something incredible together. It's almost inevitable that there's going to be some failure in the interim. The grand plans are going to be disrupted, but they're not going to be upended. It's still possible to implement those plans. And therefore, reading about how nothing was lost, I think, could provide us a nice degree of consolation. The Parsha, and indeed the book, concludes that God instructed Moses on the day of the first new moon, on the first of the month, which is the first day of Nisan, you erect the tabernacle, the tabernacle of meeting. Again, we go through all the details of assembling and setting up the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the tabernacle is erected. Moshe puts all the vessels in the correct place. He does it in a very specific order. Everything is completed and the book ends. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Hashem filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter. There was such intensity in God's presence. He was only able to enter once the intense cloud subsided a little bit. And this cloud would also indicate when it was time for the Jews to embark on their journeys and the Parsha and the book of Exodus ends for the cloud of Hashem would be in the tabernacle by day and fire would be on it by night before the eyes of all of the house of Israel. 
throughout all their journeys. Chazak, chazak v'nis chazek. Be strong, be strong, may we be strengthened. We have concluded the book of Exodus. The Mishnah, the tabernacle, has been completed. And I think of this uh, somewhat like a, like a lunar mission. You know, we're going to the moon. You spend all that time detailing every aspect of the spacecraft, every aspect of the suits, of the astronauts. Everything is planned down to perfection. And finally, we have liftoff and everything works out exactly as promised. The presence of God indeed is dwelling in the tabernacle.